Welcome everyone to the webinar on land rights and mine action. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Chris Sell from the Mine Action AOR. I'm co-hosting this webinar along with Shoba Raro from the Housing, Land and Property AOR. Um, thanks to all the colleagues who are joining us today. We have a very good mix of field practitioners, colleagues from Geneva, and a few donors. Looking at the profiles of those who have joined us, we have diverse participants, deminers, experts in housing, land, and property, general protection specialists, and some shelter experts. Now, a few grand rules or housekeeping rules, uh, given that this is a, a WebEx-supported uh, webinar. Uh, so the panelists, our three panelists, will speak for 30 minutes, 10 minutes each, and then we will have about 50 minutes for the discussion, and then a few minutes for the wrap-up. It is the first time that we use WebEx, so please bear with us so we don't master the technology fully. The user guide is over 100 pages. Uh, but we, so we're trying to limit our use of the functionalities, and the next webinar we'll do more. Um, right now we're going to mute everyone uh, to avoid having people talking at the same time, except, of course, the panelists. If you wish to speak during the discussion, please click on the raise hand button, or you can also send us a comment or question uh, using the chat box. If you would like everyone to see your comment or your question, send it to the host, and then everybody uh, will be able to see it. Feel free to ask questions. Remember, there's no stupid questions. And we'll try to answer them either during the webinar or we'll follow up later. There is a, an FAQ on the, on the GPC website related to our topic, but you know, if there are many questions coming up, we may decide to, uh, to update it. We will record the webinar for colleagues who were not able to, to participate, and then we'll post it on the, on the GPC uh, website. If the connection gets interrupted, please close uh, the browser window and join the meeting again. Shoba will now elaborate further about the objective of this webinar and introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Christelle. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, basically, there are two objectives. We um, wanted to focus one uh, issue was about working together, so increasing the collaboration between the Mine Action AOR and the Housing, Land, and Property AOR. So that's really, really key for us. Uh, also, you know, to maximize our resources to ensure we have more um, joint protection analysis. Um, so that's really the, the objective number one. The second um, really focus here, uh, to start off with the webinar and, you know, to carry this work onward is basically looking at the global study that was conducted uh, in, you know, from 2010 to 2014, there was a global study that by GICHD, that's the Geneva International Center for the Mining, and the HLP AOR, um, Mine Action AOR, and UN Habitat. And this was a study that covered um, some seven odd countries. Um, Professor Undro and Pascal, uh, Mr. Rafilad will be speaking about it further. But uh, it basically looked at Angola, Cambodia, South Sudan, Sri Lanka, uh, Bosnia, Yemen, Colombia, etc. And we would like to see what progress has been made after the study and all the recommendations that came from the study. Um, and uh, to build on that, and there was also a study that was done by Displacement Solutions and the Norwegian People Aid in uh, Myanmar, which also came up with some really, really interesting uh, recommendations and, and principles of, of engagement. Uh, so we would like to hear more from the field colleagues, and that's why we're really happy to see uh, so many colleagues who have joined us today from, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, uh, to, yeah, to, to get your perspective on what is actually happening with, um, with these studies and how do we take this forward, you know. Um, so that's basically the objective, so increasing um, more, you know, enhancing our coordination between the two AORs and, and working um, better to, to ensure, you know, uh, better protection outcomes. Um, as far as 
as the speakers go, we have three speakers, um, one based in Afghanistan, um, the other one in um, Canada, in Montreal, and um, the last speaker from uh, who's here with us in UNFCR. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Mohammad Bakili. He is currently working as the chief of staff of the UNMAS in Afghanistan. And he's got more than 20 years of work experience in humanitarian demining. So he's worked in Afghanistan and in Somaliland um, in, in various uh, roles and responsibilities. So has a massive experience as far as field work is concerned on um, humanitarian uh, demining. Our second speaker, I mean, he needs no introductions for the housing, land, and property uh, colleagues. He's Professor Unru, John Unru. He uh, his speciality is basically restitution uh, claims in post-conflict countries, and he again has uh, 25 and more years of experience in working in different contexts in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America. Uh, we are really happy to have uh, <laughs> Professor Andrew here, uh, especially considering that he was also part of the study. So he is also bringing that uh, institutional memory for us. Um, and he also has worked um, with, you know, uh, various donors, with, with World Bank, with UN, with NGOs, you know, really a, a big spread. Um, and lastly, we have Mr. Rafilad, Pascal Rafilad, who is um, the Chief of uh, External Relations and Policy here with the GICHD. Again, uh, another expert in the field. Uh, and um, he has also more than 10 years experience in the GICHD, yeah. And um, also a, a lot of experience that he comes with as far as policy uh, work is concerned uh, of, of demining. Um, he has also worked with the Swiss uh, Foreign Ministry, so he also comes with the, with the government um, uh, background. And he's also worked with the French National Commission on Anti-Personnel Landmines in, in France. Yeah, so that's uh, yeah, a really rich um, source of um, experience and expertise. Over to you, Christelle. Thank you very much. So we're going to start right away with uh, Mohamed Wakil uh, to give us the field practitioner's perspective uh, and using the wealth of, uh, of experience that uh, Afghanistan has. So, um, Wakil, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Crystal. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm uh, Mohammed Wakil, the Chief of Staff for Onmas in Afghanistan. So, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, talking about the land rights uh, and uh, mine action. So just checking, Crystal, I'm clear. Should I go ahead? Perfect. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, the issue of uh, 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 land rights, actually uh, the aim of uh, my presentation uh, today, that how can humanitarian mine action contribute to land uh, conflict and uh, very brief uh, overview of the housing, land and property issues. Um, uh, we had, uh, as Shoba mentioned, a global study um, uh, in 2010 uh, run by GICHD and Afghanistan was part of uh, that study. Uh, briefly, I will talk uh, on the land rights uh, uh, how uh, much complicated land rights is in Afghanistan, very briefly, and then how landmines uh, make the land rights more complicated, uh, what are our current processes, and uh, what are uh, our recommendations. Before uh, moving uh, into the, the, to, to the actual uh, uh, land uh, rights issue, uh, just briefly mentioning that Afghanistan is a landlocked uh, country. Uh, it mainly uh, has uh, rocky mountains and deserts with very little vegetation makeup. Uh, 
Um, and uh, some of the land rights issues in Afghanistan, that uh, there is a general uh, vagueness in land uh, tenure system or, or land rights issues. Uh, land, as I mentioned, it's a very sh uh, shortage of land, land because it's, uh, Afghanistan is uh, a landlocked uh, country. And uh, the issue of land grabbing is uh, very high in Afghanistan. Uh, the institutional capacities, the human resources, and the coordination in relation to the land rights uh, had been found uh, very weak uh, during our uh, study. Uh, in 2010, and uh, the issues of uh, refugees, the rapid population growth and urbanization, um, corruption, literacy, uh, the ethnic conflicts, uh, these are some of the uh, challenges um, uh, that, that currently actually exist uh, in Afghanistan. The lack of inadequate ir irrigation infrastructure is uh, something to be also highlighted. Uh, the first uh, agenda, uh, I called it land rights, is complicated issue in Afghanistan. So how it's complicated, uh, the, 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 there is uh, the land reform and uh, uh, property rights, uh, it has been found to be a major issue. So uh, the first, uh, the, the first uh, constitutions or uh, related documents was from uh, 1923, and then in 1970, uh, there was uh, a major land reform in Afghanistan, and uh, later on, uh, during the Russian uh, uh, back uh, government, uh, uh, there was uh, also uh, there was some reform in the land issues. Um, then Mujahideen took over in 1987, um, so again uh, in 1992, sorry, they drafted a new constitution. So it shows that there have been um, several uh, decades or se several times the land issues had been, uh, had been changed. 1996, when the Taliban uh, regime came to power, they actually ignored all the constitution and the previous constitution and uh, so these were the the the, the constitution uh, changes or reforms uh, over the past uh, 30 40 years also afghanistan uh, uh, had since 1979 several conflict periods 1979 the the russian invasion into afghanistan and then 1989 to 92, the uh, Russian supported back government, the internal con conflict which uh, erupted in Afghanistan, 92 to 96, that also uh, contributed both to the land rights and the mine action issues. Taliban came into power in 96, again, uh, uh, a lot of refugees, IDPs, and also new minefields in Afghanistan. And the ongoing conflict in Afghanistan post-2001, it's uh, also the fighting is, on, is ongoing, the IDPs and refugees are, uh, are moving uh, around the country, I could say. The, the major issues, uh, I could uh, mention it once again, the absence of rule of law, there is no clear policy, the war and conflict in Afghanistan, as I briefly mentioned, uh, uh, is contributed to both land rights and uh, landmine, the tribal and ethnic conflicts, the homelessness, the illegal grabbing by warlords and influential groups, the urbanization and also the landmine. So these are the, the, the major issues. Uh, the landmine and ERW makes land rights more complicated. Again, uh, what are uh, the contributing factors? the unavailability of uh, contamination records or, or maps. Uh, while our uh, non-technical survey uh, conducting their uh, first start at the communities or uh, on the ground, so we didn't have the, the, the proper maps and records from the warring faction. 
So that uh, also uh, brought a lot of confusion that where are the actual boundaries of the minefields, uh, where it's actually covering uh, the, the lands of the state, uh, the lands of the private land. So that was uh, a major issue. The lack of information on the land rights. When we started the mine action back in 1979, actually, to be honest, we didn't know about the land rights issue. So it was like an emergency uh, mine action period. So our aim was to uh, to, to focus on the reducing the civilian casualties, supporting the humanitarian and development efforts. So uh, uh, land rights was actually, we didn't hear on that time, uh, honestly. The lack of mine action policy and the, the, on, on land rights, that was uh, for, for many years at the beginning of the mine action, there was no clear policy. And also the lack of coordination during the non-technical survey and technical survey. There, because there was no proper policy and guidance, so the, uh, the, the coordination of our survey teams with the, the, the land owner or the, the local shores or the government, that was uh, a major issue. And the, the principle of do, do no harm, actually probably most of our practitioners or implementers, they were not very well aware uh, of, of that uh, principle. Uh, I could mention some of the examples, a uh, few of the examples, actually we had uh, money. There was uh, a, a hill, uh, we call it Nodarhan Hill, in the capital city uh, of Kabul. And um, uh, back in the uh, end of uh, 90s uh, or beginning of uh, 2000, uh, we started uh, the clearance of that hill. But by the time the clearance of the, the hill, which was located at the right at the center of the city, so the land grabber or so the local uh, people, they were constructing their, their houses. So later on, uh, when we finished the, the clearance of that land or that hill, we realized that that was a state-owned uh, land and uh, the landowner, because there was no proper uh, coordination with the government or lack of policies, so that has uh, grabbed by the, the, the land grabber. There was uh, the second example was uh, in east of Afghanistan, in uh, Host province, uh, the and district was called Mandukri. Uh, on that uh, uh, part of uh, land, on that district, was part of our operational plan. But uh, due to the land rights uh, problems, uh, people uh, didn't allow our clearance. And that delay on the clearance due to the land uh, conflict, uh, which, which took like one year. During that one year, unfortunately, uh, one of the civilian, a young boy, was killed because of that land uh, dispute and uh, not allowing the, the clearance. The third example, I could say, it's also in east of Afghanistan, a province uh, which is called uh, Nuristan. Uh, the, the issue between the two tribes, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, mountainous uh, province and there is a very limited uh, lands for agriculture. So there, there is a tribe uh, conflict for many years. And uh, first time that we sent our land technical survey team, we did the survey, but uh, they didn't allow us to, to clear. So several civilian uh, casualties has happened on those villages. Later on, uh, beginning of 2000, uh, 2007, sorry, 2007-8, we started uh, to hire the community-based diviners from these two tribes. We made some progress, but uh, again, due to the, the, the conflicts and uh, no agreement between the tribes, we couldn't do it. So that site or that village or that district is still contaminated. The fourth example is the mechanical demining operations in west of Afghanistan, a province called Herat. Um, we, we deployed <coughs> one of the mechanical uh, machines with uh, having the uh, that mechanical machine uh, was equipped with uh, flail uh, and also the tiller. Uh, it was a flat area, 
and uh, later on the community people they, they stopped the divining operation mentioning that you you actually destroyed our land because by using that mechanical uh, flail uh, or uh, and a trailer the um, uh, the soil erosion was happening and uh, the soil was becoming uh, totally like dust so the community stopped our demining and then we deployed uh, different tools and uh, later on we realized that uh, we, we shouldn't use uh, such m machines um, uh, in Afghanistan so and we stopped the using of those machines the current uh, processes actually uh, after we did the study in 2010 we on the land rights requirement we included um, uh, the land rights issues in our land release uh, emas the afghanistan mine action standard so uh, based on the emas our uh, implementing partner then uh, revised their uh, sops or standing operating procedures our non-technical survey hazard form now includes the issue of the land disputes. Uh, for the first time, the, they go to the, the village or the community. They ask uh, whether there is a land dispute, uh, the, who is the owner of the land. So, and so also, we are asking for the permission of uh, uh, proper demining toolkits. For example, whether the community is happy with using the uh, the, the machines uh, on those areas and during the technical survey or the clearance we are uh, using the uh, a proper community liaison where in order to av avoid uh, any land dispute or talk to the local shoras talk to the district governor or the uh, village um, uh, local elders so in order that, that uh, the, the, to have a better coordination with the community and during the handover uh, of the uh, lands back to the community, we revise our form with, uh, with, with, with some statements in order that it shouldn't be considered as a, as a legal uh, document or uh, it, it's just a certificate of clearance. So that, those, those are the current uh, processes. My recommendations or our recommendations that uh, uh, further uh, enhancing the, the policy on the la land rights for the mine action. So it needs uh, to be further uh, publicized or there should be a clear uh, policy uh, of land rights uh, for the mine action globally. The land rights awareness, uh, we see still that uh, it's an issue. There is uh, it needs still uh, that we should publicize the, this uh, issue, the land rights issue within the uh, community uh, family, the, the mine action uh, family, and uh, also integrate land rights in land release activities. In any part of the, uh, the process of the land release, the land rights issue should be uh, fully integrated. Um, and the fourth uh, recommendation that um, we need to uh, identify the state-owned and privately-owned mine contaminated areas. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, exactly we do know that the remaining contamination, like uh, over 1,000 uh, square kilometer of contamination that we have in Afghanistan, uh, exactly we don't know that uh, w which part of this uh, 1,000 square kilometer contamination is belong to the government and uh, what percentage or part is, uh, is, a, is a, a private uh, owned uh, areas. So by this, uh, probably I will uh, stop here uh, and uh, I will be happy to receive any question or comments now or at the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vakil. Um, really appreciate the, especially the examples that you have given of uh, the lack of coordination that, you know, for the non-technical survey and technical survey with the um, HLP actors on the ground, the land disputes that actually contributed to the delays in your humanitarian demining, 
um, yeah. and the community actually getting upset with the, you using mechanical, you know, some some of these machines that you know that actually spoiled the quality of the of the soil, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. So thanks a lot for those examples. Uh, for sure, Professor John will pick up some of on some of the recommendations that you have given. Um, John, will you please now uh, start your presentation? Certainly. Um, can everybody hear me? Uh, we can hear you. <laughs> Great. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, what, what I'll focus on is uh, how exactly uh, humanitarian mine action can interact with land rights and inadvertently make things worse. Um, so what I'll do is, is draw on the, uh, the study that, that Shoba uh, mentioned um, uh, in, uh, that was done in, in 2010 by the Geneva International Center, Center for Humanitarian Mining and, um, and go over the six primary um, issues that, uh, that emerged from that, uh, from that study. First, however, a little, a little context. Um, uh, this interaction, the intersection between landmine uh, clearance efforts and land rights is, has always been there. Um, it's always been fairly problematic, but, but only recently have we really become to sort of uh, uh, grasp it. Um, fundamentally, land, of course, rights to land is, is always political. And this is especially the case after, the, after a war, when uh, the state was likely occupied one side in the war and, and other groups occupied or, or were sympathetic to, to uh, another side in, in the war. Um, so, so that after a war, we, we have a, a par particular situation in terms of, of, of land rights. We have a, a hyper-politicization uh, of, of land rights. At the same time, however, most of the state and customary institutions that used to deal with, with uh, land rights have collapsed or, or been damaged. Um, and so these institutions, of course, can't, can't endure uh, armed conflict, and so they're, they're no longer working. Uh, so we have um, uh, an acute problem with the politics of land rights, but we don't have the institutions to handle those. And so this is the scene, the scenario that mine action then inserts itself into. And this is why it can find itself in a, in a particularly difficult situation with regard to, uh, uh, to, to, to land rights. Um, so uh, this, this situation is, um, is particularly important uh, as we move forward from uh, conflict to post-conflict to, to de the development. And we, and we see mine action occupying um, sort of all three of those, uh, of those spaces. Uh, just a, a little bit about the, the study. Um, it, um, as I said, uh, was uh, conducted by GI uh, CHD in 2010. It looked at how mine action interacted with land rights in uh, a number of countries, Afghanistan, Angola, Angola Bosnia, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, South Sudan, and in Yemen, and then a, 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 um, a workshop was conducted in Cambodia to bring uh, the findings and the reports and the, the researchers all together to discuss what, what common patterns uh, uh, have, have emerged. But those common patterns uh, revealed six primary problem issues with how mine action creates or, or worsens uh, uh, land, uh, land rights problems. So I'll just go over those and explain uh, those, those six uh, six primary issues. The first one is, is lack of awareness uh, on the part of, of uh, the demining organizations uh, them, themselves. So that they're frequently unaware of the exact uh, nature of the land rights system that they're moving into to, uh, to conduct mine action. In many cases, as, uh, as Joaquil noted, uh, there's, there's confusion, there's um, a confrontation even over uh, who has rights to what land. Is it the state? Is it a tribe? Is it customary? Is it religion? So, so when the demining uh, organizations move into an area and they're unaware of the relationship between these different claims to land, the problem can be that whoever they see first, often government, can just simply claim that they own all, all the land, uh, particularly if that's in the law that the state owns all, all the land, such as in, in Angola. And, and, and so then they, they start to, to demine on, on, on those grounds not realizing that they're actually going to cause a great deal of conflict once land is released, uh, because then it, 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 it creates this, um, this claiming and, and counter-claiming. Um, they also don't know how, how their, their um, demining efforts affect 
uh, lands that are adjacent to or next to the, the areas that have been uh, demined. Okay? Uh, so, so this is a fairly large effect that, that a number of the studies found. Uh, we, we had focused initially on uh, what are the land rights of the areas that have been decontaminated and are going to be released. Um, those are important, those sets of rights, but, but there's actually a broader ripple effect, if, if you will, on, on adjacent areas that can become very, very uh, conflicted as well. Um, so, so when valuable areas are demined, the areas next to those, of course, become more valuable and, and there, there could be conflict over, over those areas as, uh, as, as well. Um, many mine action organizations can hire local staff members that are not aware of, of communal or customary rights to land that, that can be uh, asserted. And this is the case in, in South Sudan. Uh, hold on, John. John, hold on. John? Yes. Sorry, John, you were muted for a, for a while. Yeah. Can you, can you, could you kindly repeat after the South Sudan uh, example? Sure. Um, so, so we're talking about uh, lack of awareness um, about land rights on the part of, uh, of mine action organizations. And, um, and we're talking about how uh, the awareness about the, the, the exact nature of land rights. Does, does the state own it? Does the tribe own it? Or do these different groups uh, uh, claim uh, on both um, uh, the, the same land? And in many countries, we see laws that state that um, the government owns all land. Uh, in reality, of course, government control can, can become uh, very diluted, uh, even a little few kilometers outside the national uh, capital. And in reality, uh, local groups in a customary way or tribal way actually have de facto control of, of the land. So that if an unaware demining organization arrives in an area thinking that the government owns all the land, it's going to release the land to government. Creating, uh, creating an enormous uh, uh, conflict. Um, uh, so, so that's the, the first of our problem, lack of, lack of awareness. The second is just simply the physical um, occurrence of, of removing landmines that can start competition and, and land grabbing. If we look at, at areas that were mined, these aren't places that are marginalized or in the middle of nowhere where the mines will have no impact. The, the mines are placed in areas where they, they, they will have an impact. So these are areas that are, are valuable. They're urban areas, they're roads, they're valuable agricultural lands, et cetera. And so uh, when we remove mines from these areas, we free up these valuable areas. And of course, as you can imagine, in a post-war context where there is not a lot of, of a robust rule of law or institutions to carry those out, a great deal of, of land grabbing can go on for these very valuable areas if we're not really clear on who the intended beneficiaries are, are, are to be. Uh, so, so removing landmines can be can actually spark competition. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, the third is our, 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 our highly uh, valuable uh, notion of, of doing no harm and how landmine organizations interpret that, or how they hope to achieve the do no harm aspect. Most of them try to do this by remaining neutral in, um, in land conflicts, but that, that effort to remain neutrality actually causes harm. So, so that we found in, in the study to be a particularly interesting finding. It's a little counterintuitive, but because, uh, because removing mines is always a very, very political act, and because local communities always attach a, a mine action organization. What happened? Yeah. 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 I, I seem to be getting muted often. Hello? No, you're fine. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. I just, uh, I just have to mute newcomer. There's still a few people joining us, so I'm muting okay. them as we go. Okay. So we can hear you fine. Keep going. Okay. Great. So, so we're talking about um, uh, how uh, mine action organizations attempting to be neutral in the face of land conflicts actually does harm. 
Um, the presence of a mine action organization in a, in a, a local community or an area of a, of a, of a city, um, they come with, with uniforms, with equipment, they're at a high capacity, so they, they inadvertently automatically are attached to, to government. Um, if that government has a record of being uh, abusive, of grabbing land itself, of occupying one side in the war, then that attempt to remain neutral becomes very, very political, and, and inevitably the mine action organization is seen as being attached to one side or another in, in conflict. And so this, this idea of, of uh, uh, doing no harm by remaining uh, neutral is, is fairly, uh, fairly problematic. Um, in Afghanistan, our understanding is that they've developed engagement criteria that uh, stipulate that all land disputes mm -hmm. have to be resolved before any, um, any clearance can, can be done. That's good, that's nice, um, but again, back to lack of awareness, if uh, the mine action organization uh, talks to the state, talks to government, and is shown a law that says all land belongs to the state, then, then that can be as far as they pursue it. They're not going to be thinking, well, uh, that's the law, but in reality, what, what, are, what is the claims uh, situation? Um, the, the fourth uh, problem area is, is prioritizing which areas are to be demined first. So as we know, after many wars, there, there's many, many areas that uh, need to be demined. You can't demine all of them at the same time, and so you have to prioritize which, is, which areas are going to be first, and second, and third. Usually roads are, are prioritized first in order to facilitate the movement of, of humanitarian efforts. Um, and then residences, residential areas, including cities, are, are demined next. And then finally, agricultural land. Uh, and this can seem very, very logical, but one of the problems that emerges here is that uh, agricultural land can actually end up being demined years later. So that if people return home, and then have no place to farm because their farmland is still mined, they actually have to encroach on someone else's land, causing land conflicts, in order to engage in, in agriculture. At a broader scale, we're looking at a food security problem for a country if agricultural areas are, are put off and, and not demined until much later, because then in aggregate we have a, a, a reduction in, in, uh, in agriculture. Frequently, we, we know that mines are placed in the breadbasket agricultural areas of countries during war to depopulate or to reduce the food supply of, of one's, one's opponents. So, so the valuable agricultural areas can be heavily mined, but demined last. And it creates a lot of conflicts, again, as, as those who uh, belong on that land have to go into somebody else's land in order to engage in, in agriculture. Uh, the, fifth, the fifth item is uh, information sharing and, and transparency. Uh, mine action organizations attempt to do a very good job at, at communication. They're, they're best at doing this with government and with their, their mine action counterparts. Uh, they're, they're less uh, good at, at interacting with local communities and becoming very clear with intended beneficiaries the status of, of the land. So that if local communities, and, and frequently they're, they're not next to the land being demined. They can be scattered elsewhere in a country, often, or in other countries, uh, adjacent countries. So, so finding the beneficiaries uh, to, to land to be released can be difficult. And communicating with them the status of the land, when is it cleared, when is it to be released, can also be uh, a problem. If that isn't given a robust effort, then you have a situation where land is released, but the beneficiaries don't know, so they don't return, that allows that land to be then claimed by others, which causes land, land conflicts. Conversely, if uh, there's confusion over uh, the status of, of, a, of an area to be demined, is it released, is it not, this causes rumor uh, among, among the, the dislocated population. And, and, and these sorts of rumors can be very, very confusing, causing some people to move back onto land that has not been decontaminated and, and therefore put themselves, uh, put themselves at, at, at risk. So, so, so this idea of, of communication is, is, um, is needed. Um, and, and what the study also found was that, was that the mine action organizations do not always have the best uh, coordination or relationships with other humanitarian or development NGO efforts that, that can engage in this, this sort of uh, uh, organization. 
many, many technicians that work for my action organizations are ex-military personnel, uh, so their work culture is not one of transparency and effective communication. And so we, we found that a great deal of, of work needed to be, uh, be done there. Um, and the sixth, uh, the sixth primary um, uh, problem is, is uh, women's land rights. As we know, after a war, because uh, men are mostly the combatants, there's a, a, a great surge, an increase in female head of households after a war. And so for female head of households to try to reclaim land is a particular problem, because in many customary land tenure systems and in many state land tenure systems, uh, women are second-class citizens and have a, a very reduced set of, of rights. So if this is known, that, that they cannot reclaim their land, and then, of course, others will, will, will attempt to, uh, to claim their land. In many cases, women are, are less aware of land rights than male head of households. Uh, they're often likely to be less literate, poor, and have fewer livelihood uh, options. And so they, they don't know where to go. And so we, we felt that a particular form of, of outreach is, uh, is needed. Uh, inheritance for, for, for women is a particular problem. Um, if the male head of household is, is gone, um, in, in a number of countries, we would think that the female head of household then inherits, inherits the, the land. This is actually problematic. In many customary societies, this is Afghanistan and, and South Sudan, the land actually reverts to the deceased male head of household's brothers or in some other um, uh, scenario like that. And the, the women and often the, her children can be left unconnected to, to, to land rights. So that, that particular vulnerability of an increase in female head of households, and yet at the same time the inability of rule of law, customary and statutory rule of law, to effectively um, uh, promote women's land rights and, and facilitate their return to, to land that have been demined is, a, is a, an enormous problem. So, so those are the six broad uh, issues. Of course, um, the, the, the countries were, were highly varied, and there's a number of, of smaller issues that were pertinent to individual uh, uh, countries. But broadly, those are the, the patterns that we saw, we saw emerging from the study, and I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. I'm really, really happy that you touched upon the issues of the women's housing, land, and property rights. <laughs> I mean, it's a pity that we don't have a female speaker here with all three men, but uh, we'll do better in the next uh, webinar of ours. We'll get more female speakers. Uh, I request now Pascal to, to speak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Should be okay. Let's Should be okay. The mic. Is that the mic? Yeah. Okay. I start? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon all, uh, everyone. My name is Pascal Rapillard. I'm head of external relations at the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining. The acronym is GICHD. I know it's a huge challenge, including for GICHD staff, so we call it Geneva Center for the purpose of today's presentation. Um, I mean, we heard from, uh, from Walik for us that land property and land rights is a major or are major issues in Afghanistan. We heard from Professor Unru that mine action can exacerbate land rights related challenges. So in my part, I will focus on some specific measures that mine action organization can deploy to mitigate those challenges. And some of them were already alluded to uh, both by Wolik and, uh, and Professor Unru. Um, of course, I mean, perhaps the, the, the starting point of our discussion is really that mine action is first and foremost about releasing land. It is really, it's an activity which involves a, ch a change in the status of land and boundaries, and it has de facto an influence on land rights. It's about transforming inaccessible areas into accessible and exploitable land. So it is thus important to have as much clarity as possible on land rights and land ownership before undertaking clearance operation. Mine action by definition is a humanitarian undertaking and we should always ask ourselves if the land is given back to the intended beneficiaries and those most in need. As a matter of principle, it is beyond the mandate of mine action organization to fix land problems. However, there are a range of actions that they can take to ensure they do no harm and respond to the land issues they encounter. So as I said, I will focus on specific actions, nine specific actions, as identified and captured in this famous now GSHD policy brief issued a few years ago. 
And these actions are mainly targeted at mine action organization. However, some are also relevant for other actors, uh, in particular donors. So let us start. The first action, and probably the most important one, we heard already about it, is for mine action organization to liaise with humanitarian and development organization dealing with land issue. Such land rights special organization can advise mine action actors on land rights issue in a specific local or national context. This is really key, and it, it, I concur um, with also Professor Hunru's um, um, statement that mine action is somehow, um, in some cases, disconnected from the broader security and development uh, framework and sectors. And there is still, although a lot of progress has been made, um, there is still much more to do um, to make sure that mine action doesn't work in silo, that it is connected to broader security and development issues, and including land rights run. And of course, um, these go uh, through a dialogue, through exchange, through interaction, through meetings with organizations involved in this broader security and development nexus, including land rights organization. The second uh, specific action recommended and that could be undertaken by man action organization um, is related in a way also to what uh, Walik um, referred to as stress, the lack of information on land rights on the side of mine action organization, but also on the side of communities. Um, and so it's really key that mine action organization raise awareness about land rights with affected communities at both the planning and uh, also the survey stages. And I mean, uh, also it has been said, mine action organization interact directly with local communities that are one of the most high capacity and well-resourced actors present in rural areas. So informing local authorities, local communities about the land rights would reduce prospects for land grabbing. And if this is deemed to, to be too delicate for mine action organizations, they should partner with NGOs who are able to engage in this community work or simply refer communities to the right organization. Third, mine action organization should consider land rights when setting mine action priorities. We should avoid clearing land that is disputed if there is equally high priority undisputed land that needs to be cleared. At the same time, information should be communicated as to the reason an area is not being cleared, and actually this might encourage dispute resolution to move forward. Fourth, promote community participation in priority setting. Um, to use community liaison and surveys to identify community priorities, concerns regarding land use, and perceptions of tenure security is key. We shall not forget that the intended beneficiaries of many humanitarian demining activities are frequently marginalized people, and they're lacking also adequate legal protection and awareness and information about their legal rights. So obtaining this information prior to any survey and clearance will, will decrease the risk of or preempt illegal land grabs and the reclassification of areas once cleared. This will require locating and contacting beneficiary communities before they return to the released land in order to identify their needs. And of course, this can be a real challenge if we're in, confronted with situations uh, with IDPs or refugees who are not actually yet, who have not yet returned to their, to the, to the land. Now, the fifth point, um, as Wolik explained, uh, a, he told us about an example when uh, mechanical assets uh, were being used and that actually it destroyed, it destroyed soil, so it exacerbated some tensions. And this is true actually also when humanitarian clearance is undertaken uh, in border uh, or boundaries uh, areas. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, using mechanical assets uh, can destroy boundaries, other um, uh, man-made or natural boundaries, and thus it would be recommended to switch to other type of assets uh, mainly uh, animal or, or, or manual uh, demining assets. Six, uh, we should really ensure also a formal land hover process. This is true for a number of reasons and including in order also to uh, uh, capture uh, some uh, land related issues. Uh, although, I mean, again, a land hover, uh, uh, a land hover, a handover documentation uh, will not equal to uh, any uh, uh, legal uh, documentation um, in terms of land rights or land ownership, but still it can include and be used as an information also on, uh, on, uh, on land, different land dimension. Another dimension which is key is post-clearance assessment. Uh, again, here a lot of progress has been made in mine action, but still we don't do this enough. 
and post clearance assessment should be really uh, promoted and become actually a regular part uh, of my, any mine action undertaking. Um, and this is related also to the outcome. I will get back to this later. Uh, but what mine action is seeking to do is not to um, destroy X number of mines or uh, to clear X kilometers, square meters uh, of land. Um, what mine action is meant to do is to allow development, is to allow access, is to allow the, the, the development of infrastructure, of agriculture. Uh, this is key. That's the outcome we should be talking about. And if we are talking about those type of outcome, then necessarily, as a matter of fact, the issue of land rights will come into play. So again, post clearance assessment is a key and key requirement. Um, as a seventh point, I will mention um, the importance of, and here I'm sure that Shobab will uh, be um, happy about this, recognize the special needs and vulnerabilities of women. And uh, it's true that there is a high proportion of female-headed households after most war, wars, which are more vulnerable to land grabbing. So we really need also to ensure they're included and actively participating in surveys and consultation in order also to take into account the specific needs and priorities. Most often times they will also uh, be the, the only memory of a household uh, during war and post-war time. At an eighth point, I would say include land rights in tendering and contracting processes. This is true for, uh, for the UN organization, for example, um, uh, in particular uh, UNMAS, which is contracting other organizations to do mine action, but it's also, of course, very true for donors uh, who can actually and should perhaps um, include specific land rights related provision in the grant agreement uh, when funding mine action. And of course, if a donor is asking for specific requirements, I can tell you the mine action organization will follow. So this can be a very strong incentive. And then the last point I would like to mention, uh, I alluded to it, is this issue of uh, reporting. Really, again, it's, it's important to, to measure progress in terms of development uh, and not be limited to the number of square meters cleared. So these were really um, specific nine recommendations or, or measures that mine action organization and donor for some could, could take to, to mitigate land rights issue. It doesn't mean that the issue is solved. Of course, there, there is still a, a lot of work to be done and, and to be implemented. Um, and when we started to work on this topic uh, together with, the, with other organizations, uh, uh, there was little understanding of the impact of mine action operations on land rights issue. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to, to, to look at it now and whether there has been any change between 2010 and 2017 as we speak in terms of understanding uh, of those issues. Uh, a second uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, perspective dimension um, would be also to look at how land issues could be better integrated into priority setting processes. Um, this clearly could be another question to be addressed. At the GSHD, at the Geneva Center, we have developed a tool which relies on a geographic information system, and it allows users to rank hazards according to the proximity to vulnerable asset, assets. This tool is designed to be used by a wide range of, um, of stakeholders who can define their own impact criteria and weight them relative to one another. So, for example, land rights status could typically be a criteria that is taken into account. For example, less priority may be placed on hazards that are affecting land for which ownership is not clear. And alternatively, higher priority may be given to hazards that are impacting communal land rather than land owned by individuals. And last, at the third point uh, of my conclusion, the increasing mine action work in urban environment um, deserve attention. Um, it changes in a way uh, the way uh, to some extent mine action organizations uh, are working. Um, there is a difference between a minefield in Cambodia and urban clearance work in Syria, um, and UNMAS know, knows this very well, uh, um, and the same is true for, for a number of mine action NGOs. Uh, uh, these are totally different situations, different contexts, and uh, there might also be uh, then different dimensions in terms of land rights um, if we compare the, those two different situations and contexts. So to sum up, um, I would say that mine action is not a purely technical undertaking. It is related to broader issues and often takes place in complex environments. Mine action can be political, and this is where actually the very DNA of mine action might need to perhaps uh, uh, evolve or uh, um, be adjusted also, because it's true that mine action likes to be perceived uh, or to perceive itself as a purely technical sector. Uh, but it is not. It is working in specific contexts. 
And there are uh, more, uh, let's say, um, political dimensions that need to be taken into account. Um, there is, of course, uh, there are, in a way, two uh, major also humanitarian um, principles um, uh, somehow that might not contradict, but um, that, that need to be balanced in our efforts. And I mean, on one hand, there is this, this um, uh, the fact of uh, the importance of national ownership, right? It's really key. National government should be the one responsible for setting priorities. Um, so it shouldn't be up to my national organization to define priorities. That said, they should influence priorities. They should also help guiding national authorities and governments, if need be, to set the right priorities, taking into account land rights issues. And of course, there are situations where um, um, the government is, is lacking um, capacities in really, really immediate post-conflict scenario, where typically there would be, uh, for example, the United Nations, um, UNMAS, who would be managing a, a program, uh, a mine action program at a country level, and that is then also, of course, a, a possibility to, um, to discuss priorities. To conclude, my last sentence will be um, that the silo approach must be a thing of the past, and mine action should be increasingly linked to broader issues, um, to broader security and development issues, including land rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. I will speak from your, one of the issues that you have raised about the uh, priority setting. And if I can request uh, Vakil, if you can start off with how does priority setting take place on the ground? I mean, how, how do you prioritize, um, you know, as to what area to be um, demined? And if uh, you can talk about, uh, Pascal, about your, uh, this tool that you have developed, is that something that's used only in the GICHD office, or is that a global tool that all humanitarian demining actors are using and you know yeah uh, because for me one of the things that really um, it's a bit worrying because when you look at land disputes I mean uh, you know some of these disputes can take forever can take years to be to be resolved so how do you uh, if you are in a you know this is a humanitarian setting you know you want to do work within what, a year's funding? <laughs> so how do you convince the donors that this land dispute can take two years or three years and then we will demine the area? So, uh, so Vakil, if you can um, talk a bit about your priority setting and then Pascal, if you can. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Shoba. Um, uh, within uh, the mine action program in Afghanistan, uh, the priority setting is happening uh, actually uh, till 2016 by ONMAS, but now it's handed over to the national authority, the government that we are supporting. So there are uh, we are uh, doing at uh, the national level uh, setting the impact classification of the minefields. There are uh, almost uh, 14 different indicators. For example. Uh, the recent civilian casualties, the blockages to roads, infrastructure, uh, agriculture, grazing, uh, land. So uh, different uh, indicators, uh, then we are weighting those uh, indicators. For example, the civilian casualties, if it happens uh, within the minefields or uh, close to the vicinity of the minefields, it takes, for example, three scores, the blockages two scores, the, the vicinity of the minefield to the community is, for example. So these, uh, by adding these scores, then we are classifying the minefields into high impact, medium impact, and low impact. But generally, this is the uh, desktop uh, analysis because these information are, uh, are captured, or we are taking them from the database or the MSWA, the mine action database, and then we are doing the contracting, uh, before that, we are checking, uh, we're asking the, 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 the implementers when we do the contracting, uh, so to physically check those minefields, whether uh, if there, there are anything is changed, so they, we could replace the, the hazards to, uh, to with, with the one with high priority. For example, uh, the one we are doing at, at this level or uh, at centrally, probably later on at the community level, uh, there is a new uh, 
uh, school is building or a new road is passing the community, so the priority of the minefield could be changed. So it's both uh, a mix of uh, uh, the desktop and also uh, field uh, assessments uh, that we are doing. Okay, thank you. And um, and Pascal, if you yeah. can. Sure. Um, well, no, the, the tool I was referring to is actually a tool which we are we call Prisma uh, Property Setting in Mine Action, and it's really based on uh, on IMSMA, uh, which uh, what you just referred to. Is IMSMA stands for Information Management System for Mine Action. It's a it's a, um, a system which allow to 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 plan and manage operations. Uh, it's based on, on a GIS um, functionality, geographic information system. So basically, it allows to, to, to produce maps um, where we can record uh, both uh, the contamination but also the work done. And now this Prisma is somehow an emanation uh, of IMSMA. Um, it's a, a subsequent or an add-on uh, feature, if you want, uh, which will allow a management program to set um, a number of priorities up to each program to, to set their own priorities, right? Um, and then the, the, those priorities um, can be um, captured in those maps, and then um, those maps will be also then helping guiding uh, uh, the work, the priority setting exercise. We were mainly thinking about priority in terms of proximity to schools, for example, or to medical centers. Um, things like this to residential areas and so on, um, but definitely any uh, priority criteria can be um, added or developed by, by a management program. So land rights, for example, could be one of the criteria, and then it would appear on the map, and it would, it would also help among other criteria to, 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 to set priorities. Okay. And when you do this mapping, do you overlay the... Vakil, do you overlay with the cadastral information by any chance? Is uh, Arazi, is uh, Arazi sharing their cadastral maps at all? Do you ever overlay both the maps? Uh, yeah, can, can, you, yeah, can you a little elaborate it? Sorry. So if the, um, uh, the Afghan government cadastral services, if they, the Arazi were to give you their cadastral map, would you overlay that with your, um, you know, the contaminated uh, information and then decide so that if there are land disputes, if there are possibilities of land grabbing, if you know that, you know, this is a place where you could have very many vulnerable people uh, or possible ward laws owning the land <laughs> that you don't be mine. I mean, is, is that kind of overlapping also done or, or this is something that you could be looking at in future? Uh, it is very interesting. Uh, while uh, Pascal was speaking, actually, I, I noted that uh, uh, some of the issues that uh, we have to consider it, so it's the benefit of this uh, webinar. So we haven't done, actually, so that uh, overlaying of the, the, the cadastral map the, to show that, uh, uh, for example, the, the land is belong to the government or it's a private land, where all the, the grabbing of land is happening or something. So it, it hasn't happened yet, uh, so, but um, we are looking to that to, to if, if somehow to include that uh, in our prioritization system. Um, so one of the things during the, uh, my discussion on the prioritization, uh, for example, the, we did a study a few years back and then uh, we realized that, uh, for example, women within the communities they are very worried about uh, the closest minefields to their community because their children uh, shouldn't approach there. So the, the buffer within the community, for example, uh, 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 like a kilometer buffer from the center of the community to the closest, so these have been also considered. So, or, or the view of the women is part of our prioritization system. But uh, regarding that question that you mentioned, we are planning to, to apply that into our system. Yeah, thank you. Because uh, we know that the you know, D-miners are excellent maps. And uh, in, in countries where mapping could be a challenge, you know, this could be also shared with the HLP actors so that they can also use you know, uh, your, your, uh, your maps. Yeah? 
Um, I want to draw in uh, Professor John here about this. Um, you know, Pascal raised this very interesting issue that, you know, this study that, uh, which we did some years ago was very rural uh, focused. If we are to look at, you know, uh, John, you have worked extensively in Iraq and Syria and, and written um, a great deal. Can you um, look at some of the HLP issues and how different that would be from a rural uh, context to an urban context and, and, and uh, you know, um, give us a bit of a flavor of what that will look like, you know, the HLP issues from you know. Um, John, can you hear us? Yeah, certainly I can do that. Um, we currently have a project in Iraq which, um, which looks at uh, return of, um, of uh, to housing land and property from people from areas that have been recently been retaken from, from ISIL. And what, one of the things we're finding with, is that uh, there's a great deal of uh, IEDs, landmines, uh, explosive remnants of war, even booby trap. Um, in, in dense uh, urban urban areas, and so and so, of course, the point of all that is is to sow fear, uh, to to returnees, and and it does. Um, another point can be to uh, cleanse certain areas of certain demographic groups in in an effort to uh, pursue demographic uh, change. The uh, the current government in in Syria has been accused of uh, of using. Um, uh, explosives for, for, for that reason as well. And so that uh, uh, demining uh, those areas can be, can be sort of problematic in the same rights way that, that, um, that rural land, lands can be, but, but of course it involves many more people. And, and it can be particularly problematic where you have um, residences that are in, in tall buildings. So, so it, it's one thing to have uh, settlements of single-story or two-story buildings spread out, each one with a compound, et cetera, in an in urban area. It's another to have multi-story buildings with different families living on uh, on different floors, some of which are booby-trapped or, or mined, uh, others are not, et cetera. And so, so, so the, the, the problems can be um, particularly in, intense there. Um, so, so one of these is, is that um, if uh, a family seeks to return home and they, they think that an area is mined, um, instead of returning home, of course, they'll, they'll go somewhere else, which means they become a secondary occupant in someone else's house. So, so if, if that then the person decides to come home and, and finds that secondary occupant there, they then have to go somewhere else to, to live until someone's out of there. So you have a bit of a domino effect there in, in urban areas um, as these, these, um, these mines are, are present. Um, well, we're not really familiar with, with the technical specifics of how urban areas are, uh, are demined. Um, if you can imagine, a, a lot of this comes out of, of a survey um, about which areas are mined, and, and that survey interacts with local communities. So we, that's a survey depends on a local community to communicate to the mine action organizations where they believe the, the mines are uh, and, and where, where, where they are, are, are not. So that interaction with local communities is, uh, is fairly important. It was once thought to be a, a shortcut to, in terms of mine action to, to simply hire the people after a war, hire the people that laid the mines themselves, um, a, given that there's often a lack of, of record keeping um, that, that, that goes on. And so uh, that's good, but that's employment. And of course, everybody wants employment after the war. You don't really know who you're hiring. And so that, that's, that's turned out to be a, a difficulty. Also in urban areas is, is the nature of warfare um, and, and how, how mines are, are laid. So, so as we see in, in, in Iraq, there are moving, moving lines, moving front lines, so that one side in a war will occupy an urban area and they'd get pushed out by another side in the war. If both sides are laying mines, right, in, or, or uh, IEDs, et cetera, in an urban area with no record keeping, you have, you have waves of, of mine laying in, in urban areas with no, with no record keeping, and, and so the ultimate uh, product of that can be very, very difficult to, um, to, to sort of uh, retake. Um, so, so they are particular issues. Uh, uh, as Shoba mentioned, the, the study that was done in 2010 uh, by the, the Geneva Center did focus on rural lands, 
Um, and so this is a this is a a, a, a gap. Uh, this is something that that actually needs to be looked in, uh, into further. This interaction with urban land. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, do you want to ask the question this way? Yes, please. Um, let me maybe briefly introduce myself first. I'm uh, Siet Blom. I work for the Dutch mission in the field of disarmament at the disarmament delegation. Uh, thanks a lot for the three gentlemen for giving their presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I have a question that is for uh, my neighbor here, for uh, Pascal Rapiard, um, or maybe for Professor John Onra. It's also fine. Um, it is, in what ways could donor states or states in a position to provide assistance be improving how they acquire knowledge on the needs and challenges of mine affected states? There are, uh, there are different ways, and um, it's a very good question because actually the um, education, if I may say so, of donors is absolutely key because they, they are the one providing the stronger incentives for certain measures to be, to be taken by mine action organization and programs. And there are a number, I would say, of opportunities and organization also we can contribute to, to provide information to um, promote interaction and exchanges um, between mine action experts and, and donors. And um, I don't want to make too much publicity, that's not the purpose, but as a matter of fact, we at the Geneva Center, we're organizing every year a, a donor seminar mm -hmm. uh, in April for three days, which is really targeted um, at, um, at donors and aims at um, informing them uh, on the fundamentals of mine action and what needs to be taken into account in, um, in any uh, contracting ag arrangement or grant agreement. Then, of course, they, the, I would say, more uh, uh, formalized uh, a forum um, which brings together uh, the main donors and which is coordinated by, by UNMAS, that is the Mine Action Support Group, um, which meets twice a year, once in Geneva, once in New York. And this typically would be also, I guess, um, um, a forum whereby um, um, donors could be at least sensitized um, to, to certain issues um, which are important for Mine Action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why you laugh? Actually, yeah. when, when I um, <laughs> joined this, this business, I was wondering why uh, the mine action community was not talking to the good humanitarian donorship mm. group, and uh. I hope we get an invitation at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I work on it. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, Pascal yeah. and Pascal, <laughs> as you yeah. tell, it's not just the mine action community, but the HLP uh, community would also want to engage with the donors. We mm -hmm. haven't had any consultations, but mm -hmm. uh, yes, we can look at that. You know, we can, uh, of course, look at uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks okay. a lot. Yeah. And maybe from an academic perspective, if I can be so uh, so blunt to ask you as well. Sure. Uh, so, so how can donors assist? Uh, I'll, I'll agree with Pascal because they provide funding uh, uh, to the mine action organizations. Um, we found in, our, in, in the study that, that we were talking about that, that the, the international, particularly uh, mine action organizations, are very sensitive to the desires of, of the, the funders because these demining um, uh, efforts and activities are, are contracts and they're competed for between the large-scale uh, demining organizations. And so in submitting one's bid or one's proposal, uh, you, of course, have to be very keen on what the donor wants. The donor says um, uh, the demand organization needs to look at ACLP in these ways, then, then that, that's a strong incentive to push for certain standards uh, to, to sort of um, infiltrate the, the mine action community. The other one is, is uh, cooperation. So, so I think we, we've heard from uh, from um, uh, the other two speakers and myself that that we, what we would like the mine action community to do. We would like them to do more, uh, cooperate, um, do surveys, interact with local communities, et cetera. It's not just a technical exercise, except if you talk to the deminers themselves, it is a technical exercise. They're, they're military, they're engineers, et cetera. And so I, I don't think we can expect the, the actual demining organizations to do to do too much. If, however, the donors were to were to uh, push them to cooperate and, and push them to interact with donors who, who do interact with local communities, who, who are in a position to understand local HLP issues, uh, find community members, engage in local development, et cetera, that sort of interaction can then 
bring the capacity of the of the donors and and the NGOs that they fund um, into this cooperative game with with the demining organization. So that when we look at solving land disputes, uh, we're not expecting the demining organizations to to have a hand in land dispute resolution, but but that they know who to go to and they, they know who to work with to uh, to engage. So so those two things uh, use the use the power of being the funder to push for standards in terms of HLP and then and then push for cooperation because the, the, the donors have a great deal of capacity uh, in terms of local community development and interaction that, that the demining organizations uh, don't have. Yeah, thanks, John. I just wanted to add a couple of other issues to say. Uh, one is, uh, as John mentioned, the whole issue of uh, land grabbing and also, you know, uh, if the donors have leverage with these political, uh, with these governments, and if you see that many of these, you know, mm -hmm. you will find parliamentarians or, you know, government ministers who would be grabbing these lands. So if that happens, I mean, you, it's your tax money, it's your, it's your money, mm -hmm. donors' money that has contributed to the demining. Kindly request these governments to shape up and, and be much more accountable to their population and not grab the land that actually belongs to some vulnerable population, you know. So that would be an advocacy support that you can provide to, uh, yeah, that's one. The second issue that I was thinking of is more, uh, yes, you know, the new way of working and uh, humanitarian development nexus and, you know, that's all great. Can you <laughs> look at uh, more longer term funding in, instead of uh, making it annual funding, you know, the Jan to December funding is, is awesome, but uh, for activities like this that uh, would require a bit more negotiation, a bit more community engagement, you know, uh, can we look at, you know, uh, two years funding, three years funding, so that if the land issue takes a bit more time, you know, um, give us a bit more leverage so, so that, you know, we don't fail, we don't have to ask for no-cost extension or, you know, yeah. come back to you and return your money, but to, to use the money more effectively, you know, mm -hmm. that's... that's um, and my pet project, the Women's Housing Land and Property Rights, <laughs> you know, um, can you request the humanitarian demining organizations to give a gender breakdown of uh, how many women really benefited from their activities, you know? Uh, because usually, I mean, globally we know that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the men who own most of the land. So can we um, request the mine action actors to tell us, you know, how much of the land actually, what percentage was benefiting the women after their uh, demining activities, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did good the women really own this, uh, you know? Yeah. Did, did that get transferred to women? Yeah. Yeah. So these are some of the issues that comes off the cuff, you know? Uh, but of course, we can come up with a whole list of, you know, talking points for donors. <laughs> Yeah. We have a question from one of the participants, um, from Omar Azabi. Uh, when it comes to IDPs, what kind of legal instrument can be used to lobby towards local, regional, or national governments? And uh, he's referring to Article 11 of the Kampala Convention. State parties shall take all appropriate measures whenever possible to restore the lands of communities with special dependency and attachment to such lands upon the community's return, reintegration, and reinsertion. So we wanted to talk a little bit about this issue of IDP return and refugee return uh, and how this impact our issues. So I don't know if um, any of the panelists wants to take this question on the legal instruments. Maybe I'll start with you, John. Certainly, yes. There's, that's, a, that's a very good question because there's a, there is a number of, of legal uh, instruments, um, including international uh, legal instruments, uh, regarding um, uh, land and, and, and property and, and housing as a, as a right. Uh, and in some cases, there, there's some strong push for this being a, a human right. Um, and so this was the, the case in, in Bosnia and in other, other areas as, as there's attempts to say reverse ethnic, uh, ethnic cleansing and, and such. And so, and so we, we see that right being, being pushed uh, for refugee and, and IDP uh, return and restitution of, of property. And so frequently this can be um, a, a condition um, upon the readmission of a country that has been at war to the international community, meaning international economic community. 
so that the, the donors, uh, including the, the UN, um, can be very clear that, that unless there's a strong return program, a restitution program for IEPs and, and refugees, then it's going to be difficult to have good relations with the neighbors and the rest of the international community. So, so we, we can often see a, a heavy legal hand come from uh, the international sector in this regard to push strongly for, um, for return to HLP by IEPs and, and, uh, and refugees. Of course, in, in, in many cases, it's not the case, right? Uh, much Syria and, and Iraq, but the, uh, the urban areas have suffered a great deal of destruction. And so simply returning to one's uh, house that is now destroyed is, is a problem. Um, but the same legal uh, structure is there that, that uh, defines restitution as a set of remedies. So restitution doesn't just mean return to one's HLP and, that, and that's all. It, it can mean that, but it can mean a broad host of, of other remedies, which includes alternative lands, compensation, of vouchers, uh, of jobs, a very wide variety of, of what are called remedies within restitution. Uh, so, so the legal domain there, internationally particularly, is quite strong. And, um, and as we're almost guaranteed to see in, in, in Syria, when and if that war comes to an end, there's a very strong push by the international community to have the, the domestic uh, um, government respond in a way and pass domestic laws that can reflect the desires of international laws in, in this regard. Okay. Uh, Pascal, do you want to add anything? Mm, nothing, no. Thank you. Okay. And now um, I would like to give the floor to Dominique Wolsey from the Gender and Mind Action Program who has a comment. Has a comment. So hold on, Dominique. I'm going to unmute you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I have no camera, so I'm just a disembodied voice over the internet. Um, but I had a few um, comments to make. Firstly, just on, on the point you made about uh, land release beneficiaries, um, I would just uh, point out that I think most humanitarian mine action organizations do disaggregate their land release beneficiaries by sex and age already at this point, which is the best practice that we recommend at uh, GMAP. Sorry, uh, it's the Gender and Mine Action Program is the organization I'm, uh, I'm with. Uh, and our role is um, obviously the promotion of uh, gender equality and consideration of diversity within the, the mine action sector. Um, but I've got two main points really, um, and they're about community liaison and about handover. And it was very interesting to hear um, the speakers earlier talking about uh, the importance of uh, speaking to communities and community liaison but I would point out that you know when we speak to the um, Shura or the clans or the tribal representatives or the village council we've got to think about who those people are and in a lot of contexts they represent or patriarchal systems of uh, political systems basically and we've got to be careful um, as uh, actors in the sector not to accidentally leave people out of the conversation um, and that goes beyond um, gender as well that also refers to different communities we're in c countries that have uh, ethically diverse societies that you know that there are perhaps you know a division between communities and and only one side of uh, of that is being spoken to but you know when we're la when we're asking about uh you know who owns the rights to this land um and we're only including one group of people who may say well this is communal land or or something um we've got to be careful to try and i would i would advocate for trying to widen the net a bit in terms of who we speak to outside of those um limited uh fora basically um and i would also extend that as well to handover um, because we've had a number of examples in the work we've done at GMAP where we've seen in impact surveys uh, women in communities and I think Afghanistan was one of these countries where they weren't aware uh, you know six months to a year after um, the clearance had been completed that the land was safe um, and sometimes uh, handover ceremonies are, I mean they're kind of they're, 
widely used but not universally used as ways of informing communities that the, the land is now safe to use but who attends those you know is are we in a country where men and women are should, are not expected to be at public events together um, and how do we reach people that that don't normally get access to those public uh, public forums um, so yeah I suppose that was my point really in that just speaking to the local representatives in in the system of um, government that exists in in mine affected countries isn't always going to really get us uh, the best results in terms of reaching everyone uh, who will benefit from the, the clearance. And that's me. I'm finished. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, Bakil, or Pascal, do you want to take any of the... I can, already co I can only concur with, with, with what uh, you just said, um, dear Craig, from GMAP. Indeed, I mean, I think the, the disaggregation in terms of data uh, based on gender and, um, 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 and age um, is, is, a well, um, is a process which goes well within my action. I think we're quite advanced, uh, at least on that dimension. <laughs> Thanks, Pascal. Now, I agree with you, uh, Dominique, especially about uh, looking at the uh, populations. I mean, there could be pastoralist groups as well, you know, nomadic groups, uh, who may not have ownership rights on, on, on land, but they may have the, you know, right of passage, you know, yeah. and, and, and those are also rights that you need to be mindful of. And, and in, in, in very many of these countries, I mean, the uh, nomadic groups, you know, uh, yeah, at the end, of, you know, in, in many conflicts, you know, they are also the ones that are denied some of these land rights, you know. So, uh, completely agree with you that, you know, you have to look at uh, diverse, you know, groups of uh, populations, not just. Uh, and also on the point of the shuras, you know, who do the shuras represent? Are they uh, another form of political elite that you are uh, than, you know, um, handing over the land to, you know? Uh, and if the shuras are again the ones that are sorting out or, or, or resolving these land disputes, you know, who is your counterpart in, in, in these contexts? No, I, I completely, completely agree with you. Dominique, you mentioned about a study. Uh, is that a public study that we can get hold of and share with our... Um, um, uh, I would need to I would need to go back and look. I think it's probably some work that we've done for um, a partner organization, um, which, is, which is the main way we work, but uh, I, I can check for you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so just uh, sure. yeah. uh, Alex informs us that we have only 10 minutes to go before we wrap up. Um, any last thoughts, any um, issues that uh, of our, any of our speakers want to touch upon? Pascal, John, Bakil? Uh, just, uh, yeah, Shubha on the the issue that uh, Dominic uh, mentioned, uh, the issue of the handover, uh, in some of the countries like uh, Afghanistan, it's uh, really a challenge. It's still a challenge. For example, um, in, in uh, like 40 to 50 percent of the areas that uh, we are operating in the south of Afghanistan and others, uh, the security is not uh, very good and. Uh, uh, the participation of uh, women in some of these uh, handover uh, ceremonies, in, in some cases, it's not uh, uh, possible. It's not uh, the cultural uh, problems that, uh, that. But we are trying actually after these um, studies and uh, the inclusion of uh, gender mainstreaming into mind action. So we, we are uh, advocating that. Uh, if, for example, if women participation is not uh, uh, possible in, in a public event, so we should look at other means, for example, briefing the closest um, girls' children or boys' children uh, in the community, uh, so in order to inform the girls or the boys uh, within the community. Because normally in the past, uh, for many years, only elders of the communities were attending the handover ceremony. So it's, a, it's an issue, and um, we are having some problems still, but we are trying to, to somehow reach to, to, the, to the women and uh, girls and boys in order to have uh, disseminated information to all members of the community. Thank you. Thanks. Could I, could I just uh, jump in there? Um, 
I was reading this uh, earlier this week about an example in um, South Sudan where they were having a handover ceremony and they noticed that it was only this sort of senior men in the community that had come. So they invited some women along, but they just sat at the back without, you know, um, really engaging. So they decided to split the group into two because this was more culturally appropriate and they had a separate meeting for the men and a separate meeting for the women. And they were able to do that because they had mixed uh, liaison teams. But um, yeah, so I think that in other countries they've maybe faced these cultural barriers as well and um, come up with ways that were context appropriate to, to deal with it. So, yeah. Um, thanks a lot, Dominic. Thanks for that intervention. Uh, John, do you have any last thoughts? Any anything you want to share? Yes, just just to uh, uh, touch again on on uh, Dominic's point about about local community uh, liaison. Um, in some cases, it's, it's clear who the local community is, and and in, in some cases, it, it's not. Uh, particularly if the land is is contested, or if those who were dislocated actually arrived. A couple of generations ago, and can be seen themselves as newcomers, and so this is an opportunity to to get them off the land, so that those that occupied the land well before them can now can now reoccupy the land. We're running into that in in Iraq, where where people are returning to areas retaken from ISIL, only to find uh, their um, their residence is being mined by the individual, not by ISIL, but by the individuals that Saddam Hussein removed from the area a generation ago. They're they're now uh, seeking to come to come back. So so who exactly is the community? It can be can be frequently a a, a problem. And then and then how to find the, the community? In Angola, people were returning uh, to their land and property many years after the war is is uh, is over. So, so what do we mean by community? Are they are they living next door? Are they dispersed? Are they in neighboring countries? So, so communicating to all or most of, of the community of beneficiaries, as Dominic notes, is a, is a real trick that that uh, certainly still needs some some effective work. Thanks, John Pascal. Yes. No. Thanks. Just um, perhaps as a final remark to to thank you very much. Uh, uh, both of you, Chris and Shoba, for the organization of this of this webinar, uh, and my my panelist colleagues. Um, I think we raised quite a few and identified a, a few dimensions which will deserve uh, further work. Um, we all understand, I think, and agree that um, land rights needs to be mainstreamed further within my action. And so, we'd be interested to know also about next steps or what you have in mind in terms of follow up to, the, to this webinar. I think at first it would be interesting to have a trace of this, uh, this discussion somehow, somewhere, and also then perhaps, I don't know if there is any way through this uh, system to hear feedback from participants to see also what is the level of interest, whether there is demand for further work on this, and um, I think this could well then guide our, our, our future consideration on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, that's a good wrap up, Pascal. Thank you for that. Um, we have had uh, really amazing participation uh, and, and colleagues have joined us from various countries, from Nigeria to Niger, as I was uh, you know, mentioning in the, in the beginning, uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Turkey, a lot of the colleagues from the Syria operation. Uh, so the level of interest Myanmar. is, is uh, Myanmar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the level of interest is really, really huge. Uh, and yes, I mean, the study that uh, happened years ago, 20, you know, that I think there's, there's, it's, it's always good to revisit some of these studies and what, uh, you know, has been the impact on the ground. I mean, uh, Vakil has already touched upon some of the issues that have been actually mainstreamed into their checklists and questionnaires, which is, which is awesome. But we do want to see where else, you know, what are the other countries? I mean, the study was in seven countries, no? Angola, Yemen, Yemen. I mean, look mm -hmm, at all mm -hmm. the work. I mean, that yeah. needs to happen in Yemen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, there, we, uh, we will surely um, want to revisit the, the study. Uh, and uh, Christelle and I, we have a long way to go. We have to actually touch base with all our members and also see... Uh, how much um, our different members also want to commit and, and want to take this uh, work forward. Uh, IOM was part of the study, the, the, the last global study. NRC was, so was um, the Danish Demining 
um, colleagues. So we will, um, of course, touch, mm -hmm. touch base with um, all of them also to see uh, how much interest they have, you know, to, to follow up uh, on this. Um, and uh, a few other, uh, yes, we will be, uh, so this uh, has been recorded, so we'll put it um, on the uh, Mine Action AOR, our uh, HLP AOR, and of course GPC, Alex, we will be uh, putting it online, the recording. Uh, so for those of us, because we have a few colleagues who are in the field uh, who could not attend today, so we will have the recording um, you know, to facilitate this. Um, and um, as uh, Sitse, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm killing your name. Sitse. <laughs> uh, we will have uh, a one pager on what we can expect from the donors. You know, the donor yeah, support on uh, on this issue, the land rights and and uh, mine action. Uh, yes, of course. So that will be uh, another issue that we'll follow up on. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot to everyone who is uh, who is here with us, and uh, those of you who who are not. Uh, with us that have sent their uh, questions and uh, queries, uh, we will be in touch. Yeah, so this is the start of a conversation, uh, and we will follow up with uh, with all of you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And if you have any suggestions, as as Pascal was saying, um, any uh, specific um, follow up that you would like us to do, please do send in your. Um, uh, uh, through through emails. I mean, you have all our all our emails. Please please do get in touch with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And have a great and uh, great day the rest of the day. And uh, stay safe. Maybe I just add one word. I want to thank Shoba for working today. It's her birthday, oh. which is so happy committed birthday. to the yeah. issue that she agreed to host <laughs> this webinar today. So. Um, but anyway, it's just uh, to show how dedicated she is, and, mm -hmm. and therefore we will move forward with this. Thank you. <laughs>